Hello everyone, my fellow time travellers. That's become such a very familiar phrase in my mouth <laughs> in recent months and years. Uh, I even I even find myself uh, saying hello to the GB News audience on a Saturday night uh, as time travellers. <laughs> it's really become completely ingrained in my thinking. Uh, but it's the more the merrier and it's lovely to have as many of you as possible along with me for this journey through space and time. Uh, this is a moment in the week, and there's more than one now, but we take time out together to contemplate the past and its potential for instruction regarding the present and the future. Um, it's by paying attention to history that I, I don't know, I suppose maintain a handhold or a, or a foothold on what's going on. Okay, before we get started on today's episode, it's the usual thank you to all of those who support this podcast series by uh, buying into my patreon.com site. Uh, it's that financial support that makes the podcast series possible uh, on, on the, the bigger picture. So if you're already there, thank you. If you're not and you'd like to join the family, go to patreon.com, look for me by name, part of some cash. You can join by the month or you can join for the year and it is cheaper by the dozen, I can tell you that. And become a member, join the family, be part of the community, sharing ideas, listening to the, taking part in the question and answer sessions, the occasional competitions, vodcast podcasts and ideas can be shared within the community. And I'd love to have you as part of that family. So get along there. That's the end of the advert. It's now time to strap yourselves into the time machine as we set off on the next stop on my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. be up on deck, marching about, being seen, shouting, encouraging, giving orders, and a French sharpshooter sees him and shoots. In this episode, we're stepping aboard a legend. A ship built from 6,000 trees, 27 miles of rigging, and four acres of sail. She fought in the American and the French Revolutionary Wars, she came to symbolise the British Empire's dominance of the world ocean as she battled to keep them free. But it was in 1805, at the Battle of Trafalgar, that she made her name. With Admiral Nelson at her helm, she led the British Royal Navy against the combined French and Spanish fleets, fighting tooth and nail and stamping her place in history. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me, and the whole world. I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil. In the last episode, we saw Nelson swept up in a life of high adventure and great passion, losing his arm and right eye in battle and his heart in Naples. Where are we this week? Paul, Nelson absolutely is one of my heroes. Uh, he was fearless, he was incredibly, almost uniquely talented and totally driven. So because of that, and the fact that his most famous battle had such a profound effect on the destiny of the British Isles, this week we're staying with him. With its 104 guns fully loaded and at the ready, we're stepping aboard Nelson's fabled flagship as she sails into action at the Battle of Trafalgar were on the deck of HMS Victory. This is one of my absolute favourite artefacts, places, whatever you want to call it. It's HMS Victory, Nelson's flagship, and it sits, as it has done for a long time, in Portsmouth Historic Dockyard. There's some things that are worth mentioning more than once, and Nelson, I think, is worth mentioning twice. And for good or ill, he just happens to be one of my heroes. And as well as being my hero, I think his story is just so dramatic. I have this fascination with those who don't quite make it home. I'm similarly fascinated by Robert Falcon Scott, Scott of the Antarctic, who got to the South Pole, didn't get there first, was trailing Amundsen, and then he and his team died trying to get back. I find that man's reach must always exceed his grasp. I find that fascinating. 
And of course, as everyone knows, Nelson dies aboard the Victory, just when Victory itself is about to be assured at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805. And that, that moves me. I find that desperately evocative as a story. HMS Victory is still the flagship of the first sea lord of the Admiralty. It's the oldest warship in the British Royal Navy still on active service. Although she sits moored <laughs> forever in the historic dockyard, technically, she's still on active service. How does that work? Well, she's at war. I, I mean, similarly, Royal Oak, the battleship that was sunk in Scapa Flow in 1939, you know, one of the first desperate wounds inflicted on Britain in the Second World War with the loss of 833 men and boys, she sits on the seabed. And every once in a while, whenever required, Navy divers go down and replace the ensign. There's an ensign, a flag flying on her stern because she's at war. It's symbolic, obviously, but she is at war. She's never been stood down. It's a powerful symbol of intent, of determination, of never accepting defeat. So even though Royal Oak was lost, she's still at war. It symbolises that immortal determination to keep fighting. And so victory symbolically is still in action. So if you go on board it, you're going on board a ship on active naval duty. If you like, yeah, if you like. And, and there's nothing like it. I, I, I've, I've filmed with victory in the background numerous occasions, you know, delivering pieces to camera or whatever about Nelson or about Trafalgar or about Britain. Numerous occasions, and I've been aboard her. Um, I, I, f I suppose my absolute infatuation with victory came in 2005 when myself and Dan Snow, another TV history presenter, friend of mine. We did some films to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Trafalgar. And then as part of it, I was aboard Victory on the gun deck with the first Sea Lord and uh, the British television presenter, newsreader, Hugh Edwards. And we, we talked about Trafalgar and we talked about Nelson. And to have spent time aboard Victory in that way is just... Oh, I can still persuade myself that I can remember the smell. It's the world of Nelson still to this day. It's so evocative and anyone, anyone that gets the chance, go and see Victory and, and go aboard her and have a look around and breathe deep. Uh, you know, down in the bowels of, of the ship, you know, you can sort of hear or maybe it's just sense the water still lapping against her hull uh, and there's something just, oh, powerful, powerful. It's so another of these, we talked about, I mean, I've, I've said before that really my most favourite archaeological artefact is the, is the Dover boat, the Bronze Age seagoing boat. And there's a sense in her presence of it being haunted or of having a personality or of it being, of when you're in the room with the Dover boat, it, it, she is somebody else in the room with you. And there's something of the same feeling from victory. There's something about these timber ships. You know, obviously all the warships now are, are, are built of steel and, and whatever else. They're built, they're metal. And there's just something about the timber ships for me. I've been aboard reconstructed ships. I've, I've been aboard Endeavour. I've been aboard the Doifkin, which was one of the first timber ships to encounter the Australian mainland. And there's, there's something about being aboard. I've been aboard Viking longships at sea. And these timber ships, the way they respond to the water you can almost feel them flexing in response to the power of the sea. And they feel alive. They make noises. They creak and they groan and they, and they crack. They feel like something alive. Uh, and there's something of that still with, with victory. Does it feel large when you're aboard it? That's a very good question. Obviously, by, by, by modern standards, in terms of its dimensions, in comparison to, I don't know, an aircraft carrier, obviously it's utterly, utterly dwarfed. But having said that, there's still something massive about her. Down at the waterline, she's built primarily of oak. Her keel is elm, several elm trees fitted together. But the bulk of her hull 
is oak. And down at the waterline, it's two feet thick. Two feet. And and so there's there's something muscular and powerful about her presence. And so in that way, she still feels big. It's like, you know, that, you know, Jonah and the whale. Down in these big old timber ships, when you're down below decks and you can't see out, there's something about being in the belly of a whale. There's some sense of having been swallowed by a sea creature. Or maybe it's just me. I, I just find them I just find them extraordinarily evocative. And I mean, having mentioned oak, it's hard to take in the, the extent of what we've lost by having moved on from the timber ships. A great ship of the line, of which Victory is a, is a classic example of a great ship of the line, a, a warship of, of the 18th and 19th century, built primarily of oak. And oak is the unsung hero of, say, the Battle of Trafalgar or the Napoleonic era because they consumed Britain's oak trees, Europe's oak trees. There were 27 ships of the line under Nelson's command at the Battle of Trafalgar. Ships of the line, they call them. It's the line of battle. These ships, they lined up and they went into battle in formation. And in victory alone, there were 6,000 oak trees in that one ship, okay, in amongst the, the 27 ships of the uh, British fleet at Trafalgar, it's estimated that there were 50,000 oak trees afloat, which represents 2 million years of growth. All growing at the same time, obviously, but 2 million years of growth were harvested and consumed by that fleet. <laughs> By the time of Trafalgar, that, that's why all the oak trees in Britain were cut down. The vast majority of the oak forest was gone, and Britain, subsequent to that, was importing. Had to, you know, they were looking for oak trees on the European mainland, and not just for ships. I mean, it was oak was the was the construction material of of buildings, of houses. It was the structural material. Oak's fantastic wood. If you keep it dry, you know, within a house or whatever, it lasts forever. And even in the ships, I mean, the victory is still there. She spent all her time in the water. So imagine that, 50,000 trees in 27 ships, 2 million years of growth. And all the statistics about victory are just mind-boggling. You're looking at 3,000 feet of, of spur and spruce timber, 3,000 feet in length. Uh, you're looking at uh, 27 miles of rigging, which is to say the ropes, servicing four acres of sail. Four acres of sail, 27 miles of rigging, two tons of nails and bolts, handmade, handmade of copper. And that's just, that's just in victory. 27 miles of rigging, four acres of sail, two tons of nuts and bolts, all just in that one ship, 6,000 oak trees. Wow, that is a big ship then, isn't it? Well, it is. And, and what's amazing is we couldn't rebuild one now. And not to this, well, the skills, the understanding of, of carpentry and shipbuilding that are evidence that are, that are manifest in victory. We don't have it anymore, it's all gone. And likewise, the skill of sailing, let alone fighting a ship like that, and when I say fighting, I mean using it as a fighting weapon. You know, the skills required to fight with victory, to sail with victory, are gone. And those skills had been acquired over centuries, or you might even say thousands of years, right from the Dover Bow onwards, coming right up through, through, the, through what the Vikings learned and they built there. You know, they made huge leaps forward with seamanship, with the ships that they built, the Viking longships. So there was this thousands of years of, of learning and wisdom, and it reached a kind of a high point with ships like the Victory. And now that they're gone, we've lost all of that. And when I talk about sailing them, of course I'm not qualified to talk about this, but I do know that before things came to a head at Trafalgar, the Royal Navy had been in the habit of keeping the French fleet boxed into harbour. They didn't want the French to come out. They wanted to keep them hemmed in so they knew where they were. And in order to do that, the Royal Navy kept ships, many ships, sitting off the French coast in one place for years at a time. Now, they were servicing them. Obviously, some ships were coming and going and they were supplying them with food and water and everything else that they needed and men were coming and going from them. But for a couple of years, 
every time the French looked out, literally from their coast, the Royal Navy was just sitting there in fair weather and foul, night and day, day after day, week after week, month after month, they just stayed on station. Now, the skills required to keep ships stationary in that position, we've lost it. We don't have it anymore because we don't need it. So even if you reconstructed ships like that, we couldn't sail them and fight them the way they did. And when you talk about green energy, these ships just absolutely fascinate me. You know, because we talk about, you know, clean green energy. Now, these ships didn't use fuel. They were powered by the wind. I think about how, you know, someone like a Nelson would be in Sydney Harbour, and then on a whim he could say, let's go back to Britain. And they just went. They didn't have to load up with coal or oil or a nuclear battery or whatever. They just went with the power of the wind because they understood the wind as well. It's like the Starship Enterprise. It's like engage warp power, Mr. Scott. And away they went. <laughs> and they, they, they just they could go anywhere in the world. It took them a while. You know, it took them weeks to get anywhere. But they could go anywhere without fuel because they were powered by the wind. And I just think that's an extraordinary achievement that's there. And so all of that, all in itself, is reason to go and see victory because, you know, that is part of what she stands for. Where did she begin her life? Well, she was, she was built, although we're, I'm, we're talking about really in the context of the Battle of Trafalgar, which was uh, on the 21st of October 1805, but she was actually born, if you like, if you like in 1759. So she was quite old by the time she went into action on that day of days. At 1759, for any, you know, anyone interested in history, that was, that was a big year. Annus Maribilis, the year of miracles. It was a, a year of unprecedented success for Britain in its wars against France. Britain secured victory in the Seven Years' War in 1759 with a series of unprecedented victories. And that was in the colonies, which is to say off the coast of America, off the French coast, off the Spanish coast, everywhere the British were successful against the French. The Battle of Minden, which is a land battle, victory was secured there. James Wolfe, we've talked about uh, James Wolfe and his victory at Quebec, taking Quebec from the French, the battle in which he died, but nonetheless, he died winning. And that all happened in 1759, and so if you like a little kind of unnoticed at the time miracle of 1759, you might say was the creation of victory. Although she wouldn't come into her own for you know, another half a century, virtually. She was created in 1759, but she languished. She wasn't needed uh, to begin with. So she sat in the River Medway, where she'd been built, and she didn't go into active service until 1778. Her first action was in the, well, she would see fighting in the American War of Independence and then in the French Revolutionary Wars. But then, in the aftermath of that, the threat posed by Napoleon... She would really come into her own during the Napoleonic period. It's interesting to note that um, if you go and see her, she's quite bright, an orangey colour, orange and black, but mostly you think of her as an orange ship. That's all been part of her restoration and her ongoing conservation. But before that more recent kind of paint job was put on, archaeologists of a sort stripped it back, stripped her back, and they've realised that when she was built... She was probably red and black. And then when she was fitted out again to be Nelson's flagship, she got another paint job and she was probably yellow, a pale yellow colour. Yellow, black, checkerboard kind of a fashion. So that's how she would have looked. Interestingly, when she was built, she was built in, in, a, in a dock, obviously. And when the decision was made to bring all the grandees down to see her being launched, the man who'd been in charge of her construction realised that she was nine and a half inches wider than, than the gates out of the dock. She'd been built too big. And on the day of the, of the big launch party, he had to bring a team of men in to, to hack wood or saw wood out of the dock gates so that she could squeeze out at all. You know, so she was nearly, she was, it was a messy, painful birth. You know, she only just managed to, to squeeze out. By the time we all knew trouble was coming, in the early part of the 19th century, 
She was made Nelson's flagship in May 1803, and the Battle of Trafalgar, that is, you know, one of those luminous, immortal stories, was on the 21st of October 1805. And f- for everyone concerned, that battle was a nightmare for all sorts of reasons, and not just to do with the violence of it. To begin with, as the two fleets, the combined French and Spanish fleet, and the Royal Navy, the British fleet, they were almost becalmed. The wind was so light. And so f- f- from, from first sighting one another, when the two fleets could see one another, it took six hours to actually, to actually get close enough that they could start fighting. So you can imagine what the tension was like aboard the ships. Uh, and they know they're going into a dreadful, what's going to be a dreadful, violent encounter. But imagine that you just want to get it over and done with. But instead, it took six hours of painstaking seamanship to finally bring them together. And by that time, Nelson had addressed all his commanders. You know, he'd had them aboard Victory and he told them what he expected of them. And basically, he was a commander of a sort who understood that however clever your tactics and plans were in advance of a battle, when things start, especially in a sea battle, every ship is on its own. And so every ship's captain is having his own war, his own battle, almost down to every individual sailor. And Nelson expected what he called a pell-mell battle, which is to say they had tactics, which was basically, I mean, as always with Nelson, he just wanted in amongst them. He was such an aggressive, he just wanted in, just let me at them. So he knew that once they came together, he said, look, it's going to be pell-mell once we're together. And so it was, and so on that long, painful approach, the ships, although they were still in formation, they got strung out, you know, there was some distance from one another. And the ships nearer the front were already engaged with the French for half an hour before victory got close enough to do anything. So Nelson just had to watch to begin with as ships further forward began to engage so the guns are going off and the smoke's rising and it's all happening but the crew of victory have another half an hour to wait and when they do get in amongst them if you imagine the first French ship they engage is the Bucentaur the equivalent of victory and it's the French flagship you know so it's his opposite number and victory comes in behind if you imagine, the, the Bucentaur is perpendicular to the Victory's line of approach. So Victory comes in behind the Bucentaur's stern. Now, if you picture, you know what the stern's like? It's just like, like the window's looking out at the back of those big, wide-bellied, big-bottomed ships. You know the shape of them? And Victory came alongside and unleashed a broadside. It let go with all its, all its guns. And all the guns went in through the bow and down through the length of the French flagship and knocking men apart like Skittles, which is obliterating. You can imagine, its cannonballs went in, 200, 300 men, you know, killed in an instant. Bucentaur, you know, pretty much put out of action. And at that point, because it's, they're so becalmed, the ships are all, they're all clumping together. Nobody can move. And pretty soon you've got a situation where British ships and French ships are side by side. They're kind of, they're up against one another. Their riggings are getting tangled. As they fire on one another, masts fall across. So the whole thing turns into this hellish melee of rigging and, and ships are, are held together by tangled rigging and tangled sails and all the rest of it. And they're still firing. The gun crews, even at point blank range, they're still reloading and firing into one another. Immediately behind Victory is the Temeraire, another great British ship of the line, immortalised in a painting by uh, Turner as the fighting Temeraire. And she comes in in support of Victory. Uh, And it's due in no small part to the Temeraire that the Victory even survives because the Victory was quickly under pressure from a lot of ships. And the Temeraire is is able to come in and get in amongst it and, and help Victory. The whole hellish scene, you know, people have been writing about it ever since. There's a fantastic bit of poetry uh, by John Ruskin, who's a great English poet and a a critic. And he's got lines, I can quote them here, talking about the fighting Temeraire. Those sides that were wet with the long runlets of English lifeblood, gleaming goodly crimson down to the cast and clash of the washing foam. Those pale masts that stayed themselves up against the war ruin, shaking out their ensigns through the thunder till sail and ensign drooped. Incredible violence. As well as, you know, the danger of being struck by a cannonball, 
because the ships were timber, when they were struck with, with the cannonballs, the timber would splinter. I mean, when I say splinters, great big jagged chunks of wood would fly through the air as well, smashing into people, tearing them to pieces. You know, that's where you get all these, you know, these devastating injuries that, that end up with men losing legs, losing arms, peg legs and all the rest of it. In the main, it was, it was the damage caused by, by flying fragments of timber at direct contact with a cannonball, you're just pink mist. But it was it was fragments of timber that would do the most of the damage. So once they come together, they're fighting for hours. Just after one o'clock in the afternoon, victory is cheek by jowl with a French, another French ship called the Redoutable. They're, they're together, they can't move, they're just blasted up fighting. And there's a sniper, a Frenchman, high in the rigging. Which was standard practice, you know, you'd put the men with muskets, sharpshooters up firing down onto the deck as well. And one of these French snipers spots Nelson. Nelson's very distinctive, the big hat, all these medals. He was wearing everything he had to be visible to his own men, to be seen, to encourage and embolden his own fighting men by, by exposing himself to the same danger. So he would be up on deck, marching about, being seen, shouting, encouraging, giving orders. And a French sharpshooter sees him high up in the rigging and shoots. And a musket ball from above and coming down at an angle goes just below his collarbone, a musket, and it goes blasting through his body and lodges in Nelson's spine. And Nelson, like Wolf, Wolf had expected a rendezvous with death. He, he predicted his own early demise and he was right. And Nelson, similarly, although he was incredibly brave and was always, or partly because he was always in the thick of it, predicted that he would die. And now it comes to pass. So he takes this terrible wound and he's he's picked up, he's, he's still alive, and the men they carry him down deep into the onto the orlock deck as it's known, right down, right down by the keel, right as, as deep down inside the ship as they can. Um, and he says to the ship's doctor, Ah, Mr. Beatty, you can do nothing for me. I have but a short time to live, my back is shot through. So but it's, to be honest, it's not the first time Nelson had been hurt and thought he was dying. <laughs> he always thought he was dying. But this time, this time he's right. And of course, there's nothing they can do for him. They've got no means to operate. There's no pain relief. They probably give him something, you know, alcohol maybe, you know, just something to dull the pain. But he lingers from just after one o'clock until he finally dies at 4.30. But he lives long enough to be told that, that victory's secured. There's the famous story that he says to the captain of the victory. He was the commander of the fleet. He's in charge of everything. And victory had its own ship's captain obviously answerable to Nelson, but he's the ship's captain, and this is Thomas Hardy. And everyone's heard the line about, kiss me, Hardy. And just as he is supposed to die, nobody knows if it, ever, if it ever actually happened. There's even been speculation that he might have said something like, kismet, Hardy, as in a reference to fate. Kismet is fate. And so some people have speculated that what he actually murmured in, in some of his last moments was, it had to be like this, Hardy, kismet, Hardy. As though, as though he's saying this was always going to happen. But by then he knows his other last line is supposed to have been, thank God I have done my duty. No one knows, no doubt, just drifting in and out of consciousness. There's a fantastic painting that immortalises the scene. Nelson lying propped up on blankets and with his back against the hull and surrounded by people, including Hardy, but lo lots of men looking over him. Because by that time, they had won the Battle of Trafalgar and so more people were able to sort of congregate around the dying admiral. So there's a, there's a wonderful painting that immortalises that scene. It took a while to get back. It took a while to get back home after the Battle of Trafalgar. Word was sent that went ahead. So Britain had received the news that, that Nelson was gone before his body came back. And to preserve him, his body was pickled in a barrel of brandy. Really? Yes, to, to, you know, to preserve him till they could get him back because they knew it was going to take a, a while to get him back. There's, there's stories about some of the seamen aboard the, aboard the ship drinking from it, you know, tapping the brandy that Nelson was, was, was preserved within, whether that's true or not. And I think when we talked last time about Burnham Thorpe, where he was born and where his father was the parson and had a church, he had always imagined that he would be buried in All Saints in Burnham Thorpe. But in fact, because of what he had done, because of what he had meant to the nation, he was, 
He was buried with all due pomp and ceremony in St Paul's Cathedral on the 9th of January 1806. So he dies on the 21st of October and he's not buried until January of the following year. Well pickled. But he'd be well pickled, absolutely. What did stopping Napoleon like this mean? And Napoleon was a despot. He was one of these characters that, that occurs, you know, he was determined to rule the world. You know, nothing less than the world would have satisfied him. But while he was able to dominate the continent, and he wasn't finally brought and defeated until the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, he had ten years still to run and more adventures to have, but by 1805 the defeat of the combined French and Spanish fleet hobbled him. He knew that, that while he, would, he might well be able to command the continent, he couldn't command the ocean. So he, he changed the destiny of Napoleon because he couldn't leave the European mainland. Not by ship, even though Nelson was dead. The British Royal Navy had learned nothing but how to win. They just kept on winning after Nelson. They were unbeatable and Napoleon knew it. Nelson's greatest victory and greatest memorial was that he secured the freedom of the ocean. To this day, there are no lines on the world ocean. There are no national boundaries on them. You know, nobody claims to own a chunk of the Atlantic Ocean. Nelson secured that. And for the next century, the Royal British Royal Navy policed, literally policed the world's ocean, keeping it free for free trade, for free movement, that nobody would possess it. And that gift at Mare Liberum, the free ocean, is Nelson's greatest memorial. A collection of storm-swept rocks, an island race, to survive and thrive, its people have depended on a mastery of the ocean's seaways and protection around its own treacherous coasts. Dotted around the British Isles are steadfast lighthouses, engineering marvels that have become part of the landscape. Sentinels and beacons of hope watching out for those in peril. Next time in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast, which is and always will be free, and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It would be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter, and please write a review of this week's podcast and share it with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book, it's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places, and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's love letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. Social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios, and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs> <laughs>